Good afternoon, everybody. It is Tara, and we are coming to you live from the core at Law and Cantata. Thank you so much for joining us virtually, whether you're watching on Facebook or on YouTube. We're really happy to have you join us during this lunch hour. We are wrapping up our summer lecture series with our cardiac rehab team at TMC. And I'm really, really happy to have one of my long-term teammates and fellow TMC employees here with us today, Mike Urquhart. He is kind of tying the bow on this three-month lecture series that we've been talking about. We've touched on exercising in the summer heat. We've talked about managing your heart rate zones and getting the most out of your workouts. And today, Mike is here to talk to you about how all those little pieces work together as a whole to keep your heart strong, your body's healthy, and your mind's motivated to keep going and keep yourselves healthy. So for those of you joining us today online, a few things to know. We do have a live in-person audience just behind this screen. You may hear some questions or engagement with them as Mike gives his uh, presentation today. But no, you can also ask your questions. If you're watching on Facebook, type it in the comment section. If you're watching on YouTube, please do the same and we will make sure that we get those questions over to Mike before the talk wraps up today. This will also live on our TMC YouTube channel for the next 12 months or so. So if you don't have a chance to watch this today, you know you can catch it there at a later time. And you can share it with your friends and family as well that may have not been able to watch. So Mike, thank you so much for being here today. I'm gonna hand things over to you so you can get started. All right, thank you. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody out there in uh, YouTube land and everybody out here in my uh, personal audience that I have here with me. Uh, I'd just like to say thank you for inviting me up here. And, you know, I really like to give talks. And a lot of times uh, these talks, it almost feels like I get on my soapbox sometimes. My, um, my formal training is I'm a physiologist and I look at the systems and look at how they function. But right now, I'm working at uh, Cardiac Rehab at TMC, and I'm one of their exercise physiologists. And during the day at Cardiac Rehab, I'm always talking about um, heart health, always talking about exercise, always talking about nutrition. And so what I want to try to do today is put together a nice talk about how everything kind of works together. And it is holistic health. It's something that we've always known for all of our lives, but for some reason, it's kind of hard to put together, but I'm going to help you put that together today. But anyway, so my first slide is thank you. Thanks for having me up here. So my next slide is um, holistic health physiology. And basically holistic health, meaning that you're taking everything into consideration, like your exercise, like your nutrition, like your stress management, and kind of bringing that together to make yourself healthier. And I'm going to give you the physiology behind that. The physiology is really basically the function, why all of these things happen. Physiology, same with the philosophy or uh, physics, it's the how, it's the why behind the way things happen the way they do. Oops, sorry, I can use this. But anyways, this is our human body. Before we, before we get going, I want you to keep in mind two terms, two terms. One is the monocyte. Monocyte, you don't have to do anything with that right now, but the monocyte and uh, a term known as LDL, low density lipoproteins. Sometimes when you go to the doctor, the doctor will refer to that as the bad cholesterol. I wish they would get away from that, but uh, there's nothing we can do about it. But LDL, LDL and the monocyte, that's what I want you to keep in mind right now. But anyways, uh, this first slide is just a picture of the body. The body is wonderful. And when it is working correctly, it will help correct other parts of the body. So as long as everything is in tune, you're going to function correctly. Uh, the, uh, the portion of the body that I've highlighted, of course, is the heart. And without the heart, really not too much else will actually run properly in the body. So as we're looking at this, oh boy, <laughs> as we're looking at this slide, um, uh, you can see the circulatory system, which includes the heart. The uh, Part of the circulatory system are the blood vessels. The blood vessels are like the pipes in your house. They deliver um, liquid, nutrients, food, whatever you want throughout the body. The only difference between, or the big difference between uh, the pipes in your house is that your blood vessels are actually living. It is actually living material. What we're looking at here is what can happen to those pipes, just like your pipes in your house, they can become corroded. 
if you put the wrong sorts of things down those pipes. But what we're looking at here is a blood vessel. And we're looking at, over time, to build up a plaque in your arteries. Now, we build up a significant amount of plaque from about the age of 10 years old. And every 10 years, we build up a significant amount of plaque till about we're about uh, 50, 60 years old, where we have significant occlusions. And basically, an occlusion is just a blockage of the lumen of the artery or of the capillary or of the vessel. Now, still, not too much to be concerned with right now. I'm going to tell you how we can deal with this. Um, this is another picture. When this happens in the heart, this leads to coronary artery disease. And what we're focusing in on here is just the cross section of those arteries as they pertain to the heart. Now, what we have to think about, if it's happening in your heart, I'm sorry, yeah, if it's happening in the heart, it's happening all over your body as well. Now, it used to be, and you can always think about this as, uh, we used to think of old age, you know, becoming slower, not quite as active, and, but a lot of that now is being attributed to the buildup of plaque in your arteries. Now, not just your arteries. When we think of your arteries, we think of those big, large vessels, but we're actually thinking about the capillaries as well. And some of the capillaries are small as you can When those start to become polluted, then, we can, then that leads to other issues like some of the neuropathies, um, sometimes even uh, kidney issues, nephropathy. But in this case, we're just going to think about the heart, okay? And once again, another side view, another cross-sectional view. So this is a picture of those arteries become occluded. Now, there are different types of occlusions, but this is probably one of the most popular ones. These are the ones that when you go to your cardiologist, they'll look at the lumen of your blood vessel and they'll say, oh, you're 40% occluded, you're 50% occluded. You're 60% occluded, whatever. Um, a lot of cases, most cardiologists won't even do any intervention unless you're above 60%. Occluded. And depending on where that artery is as well. Now, here is our monocyte. We talked about this earlier. The monocyte. What is the monocyte? The monocyte is actually part of your immune system. It's one of the good guys, actually. It's one of the good guys. But... In the event of an invading bacteria, an invading virus, the monocyte becomes activated to try to defend the body. Okay, let's just keep that in mind for right now. We're going to keep that, keep that in mind. Your monocyte. Your monocyte is it's a part of your blood. It's part of your blood component. Um, once again, they're activated in the, in the presence of some sort of disease state. Um, the other particle that I talked about was LDL. LDL, low-density lipoprotein. Now, a lot of people refer to the low-density lipoprotein or the LDL as a bad cholesterol. It's kind of incorrect. LDL is a vessel. It's a vessel that carries fat, uh, free fatty acids, and cholesterol to the working parts of the body. Okay? And then it's the LDL, sorry, it's the HDL, which you probably also heard about, that takes that unprocessed fat and cholesterol back to the liver. That's why that balance, you know, you always hear about a balance between LDL and the HDL. If your LDL is too high, um, it's much higher than your uh, HDL, you're at risk for some sort of uh, uh, coronary disease. But LDL by itself, it's really not a bad guy. It's actually just trying to take nutrients to the working muscles, to the working organs of your body. That's all it's doing. But, and I say that with a loud but, but in the presence, in the consumption of a high saturated fatty acid diet, meaning fast foods, processed foods, you get a proliferation of these LDL particles get a proliferation of these LDL particles. Now, here's that interaction. This is where it becomes that. And I'm going to tell you what to do about this. I like painting the picture first, and then we'll get into it. But uh, 
This is where it becomes bad. It's when this LDL intermingles with the monocell. So the LDL particles, they propagate through the walls of the blood vessel. That's normal. That's normal. They go through so they can deliver the fatty acids and the cholesterol to whatever the body needs it for. But if there's an excess of that LDL, that LDL builds up in the wall of the blood vessel. Now, during that buildup, some of that LDL becomes oxidized. When it becomes oxidized, that's when it's a bad signal. And as that bad signal, remember that word oxidized. Oxidized. Just keep that in mind. So oxidized. When it becomes oxidized, that's a signal to the monocyte to go in and try to remove that LDL. But you know what? The monocyte can't get rid of it. In fact, that monocyte injury actually causes a positive feedback loop to cause more monocytes to come in. And then in the presence of a continued high fat, high saturated, high saturated fatty acid diet, more and more LDL builds up. So that brings in more and more monocytes. And then that's what leads to the start of what is known as the fatty streak. And the fatty streak is that preclusion, sorry, of uh, coronary artery disease or atherosclerosis, okay? And that starts, how, how old are we here? Um, let's see the timeline, I'm gonna say you're about 30 years old here. You're about 30 years old, and that starts building up. And if you have a higher saturated fatty acid diet, you continue that, if you eat at McDonald's more than twice a week, or sorry, I shouldn't say McDonald's, because they'll come down on you. But if you eat at any fast food restaurant, more than twice a week, you're going to have significant buildup before you're age 30, before you're age 40, before you're age 50. And I'm not even going to tell you about 60 and beyond, but anyway, so that's what happens. That's what leads to these occlusions. It's the interaction of that LDL, which is just doing what it's supposed to do, and the interaction of that monocyte, which is doing what it's supposed to do but it's building up inside of those arteries, inside of the arterial wall. Now, once again, if we're talking about, you know, one of the large arteries, you might be good for a while, but if we're talking about those really small capillaries, the ones that are about the size of human hair, you're going to start having probably problems early on in life. And that's when you start getting tingling, not associated with diabetes, that's when you can start getting neuropathies, all sorts of things. That's when if you had been a runner, you're, all of a sudden you're not going to be, that's not all of a sudden, but you're going to not be as athletic anymore just because you can no longer deliver the proper amount of oxygen to your working muscles because those old capillaries are closed off. No, no cardiologist in their right mind is going to try and go in and, and stint a small little capillary. Why would you do that? Nobody. You, you wouldn't do it. So... The easy way to do it, and I should have said this at the beginning to make, make it easy, eat right, exercise, and reduce your stress. Did I say that at the beginning? Yeah, I think I probably did. I say it quite often anyways. <laughs> but uh, are there any questions? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. So are we talking about an inflammatory response? Uh, so the monocytes are involved in that inflammatory response. So when we think about inflammation, it is uh, basically a cascading effect from a histamine response as well. And so part of that histamine response is the activation of these monocytes. Yes. Now, the good news. The good news is that it can be reversed. It can be reversed. There was another little molecule I talked about called HDL, high-density lipoprotein. Those high-density lipoproteins is that good cholesterol, which it really isn't. I mean, it's not cholesterol at all. But what it's doing, it's another vessel. And what it does, it picks up those broken fragments of cholesterol, of fatty acids, those LDL particles. It repackages it and takes it back to the liver for reprocessing and eventually elimination. Okay, that's the HDL, 
hide and see like for instance. I know you're asking, so Mike, how can I increase that HDL? Well, there's really only a couple ways to do that. And this is the physiology of it, this is the holistic health approach to it. There's really only one good way to do that, and that's to exercise. Wow, you mean I can get rid of my coronary artery disease? I can reduce it just by exercising? How long have you heard that? Okay, excellent. But yes, so you can increase your HDL by exercising. You can also increase your HDL by losing a little weight. Huh. Wow, have we heard that before too? That's not new information. But people pay thousands of dollars, millions of dollars every year to get healthier. Well, let me tell you right now, exercise, lose a little weight. There you go. You're going to reduce your coronary artery disease risk. So there is a continual battle. Well, let me just go back to this picture. What I like about this picture is that it's the HDL that deposits, sorry, it's the LDL that deposits that lipid goo. That's what we call it. Call it that lipid goo into the walls of your arteries. That's what it's called. A lot of times that's what it's called. But it's the HDL that digs it up and takes it away for reprocessing. Okay? Now we've talked about a lot of things already. Once again, it is that constant struggle between LDL and HDL. I love this slide, of course, you know, with Sky, Skywalker and his dad, um, uh, Darth Vader, which he didn't know was his dad. But anyways, the struggle continues. That's something that your body goes through all the time. But you can help your body. You can help your body. Um, oh, yeah, we've already talked about that. Increasing your exercise, uh, losing weight can increase that HDL ratio. But now we're going to talk about something um, called antioxidants. Now, I said earlier that the LDL becomes oxidized. It becomes oxidized. Now, what does oxidized mean? Oxidation means that it's being reacted upon by a free radical. And typically, in those free radicals, it's a free electron, typically donated from an oxygen radical, um, that causes some disruption of the cellular membrane. And in this case, it's direct, disrupting the membrane of that LDL particle. And that's what's causing all the problems within the arterial wall that's soliciting, uh, soliciting uh, the monocyte coming into this shot. So, what can you do about these free radicals? What can we do about these uh, oxidation particles? Well, here's one thing. We can increase our consumption of antioxidants. Now, right off the bat, I, I, I kind of know what you're thinking. So, you might be telling me eat fruits and vegetables, or take vitamins, or something like that. Well, yeah, that's what I'm <laughs> telling you. That's what I'm telling you. How long have we heard this? Forever. Your fruits and vegetables, that's where all your antioxidants are. Vitamin C, vitamin D, all of these antioxidants. Now, there are several different types of antioxidants. There are, uh, there are antioxidants that work on uh, water-soluble membranes, and there are antioxidants that work on fat-soluble membranes. And, but by eating a variety of fruits and vegetables, you will increase the amount of antioxidants in your bloodstream, in your diet, which will help save off coronary artery disease. It's easy because those antioxidants, they will react with those free radicals. And for years they've been calling them the superfoods, they've been calling them everything. But you know what? There really isn't a superfood, they're all all fruits and vegetables are good. Okay? All right? Now, I know somebody out there is saying, but I want to reduce my sugar intake, and so I don't eat as much fruit. But you know what? Let me tell you something. If you want to reduce your sugar intake, stop eating the cakes and pies. <laughs> yeah. Stop eating all of that junk food that contains all the sugar, especially that hidden sugar called high fructose corn syrup. If you're going to err on eating 
more sugar, get it from your fruits and vegetables. Because what you're gaining from that fruit and vegetable far outweighs some chemical additive to some processed food. Okay? I just want to get that across right now because somebody always asks that. Hyperglycemia, since we're talking about sugar. Hyperglycemia. What is hyperglycemia? Hyperglycemia, just like it says, it's high blood glucose. Hyper means high. Glycemia, glucose, and semia or mia, meaning in your blood. So this is high blood glucose. This has nothing, nothing to do with diabetes. Every one of us right here, right now, could be in a hyperglycemic state and not have diabetes. I mean, I don't know what you ate before you came here, but you could be in a hyperglycemic state. Typically, we can be hyperglycemic if we eat a high carbohydrate meal or if we, eat, or if we drink a high sugary beverage. That will send our blood glucose levels above the norm. And normally, our blood glucose levels want to stay somewhere between 60 and 120 milligrams per decimal. After eating a high carbohydrate meal, your blood sugar levels could go way above that 120, even up to 300, 400 sometimes. But in a normal, normal, healthy person, soon after that, the blood glucose levels will come back down. In a normal state, they will come back down. Now, in a self-induced abnormal state, so you drink that sugary beverage, your blood glucose goes up to 320 comes down a little bit, but then you eat that cake and pie. It goes back up to 320. And then after that, you have a big bowl of pasta, and then it goes back up. Right there, ladies and gentlemen, this is self-induced hyperglycemia, and it is sustained. Sustained hyperglycemia, high blood glucose, can lead to some damaging effects in your arteries. One, you're going to shudder when I show you this one. Oh, sorry, let me show you this graph first. But anyway, so this is the graph of uh, the normal levels of blood glucose. And then, right, when you eat a high-carbohydrate meal, um, insulin kicks in, uh, blood glucose goes out. But insulin, it's a hormone, just like uh, in this other picture. Uh, glucagon is also a hormone. Oops, sorry, too far. And so when you eat a high-carbohydrate meal, in a normal situation, just like I was saying, insulin kicks in and it brings that blood glucose level back down. And the way it does it, it tells the cells to start absorbing that glucose. Because your cells need glucose. That's how we operate. They need fat, they need oxygen, and they need glucose. That's what we need. We have to have those things. But in excessive amounts, it can lead to issues. And I'm getting ready to show you one of those issues. So, um, chronic hyperglycemia can lead to, well, testing for chronic hyperglycemia, uh, your endocrinologist or even your PCP will order a test. Your, um, sorry, your glycosylated, glycosylated hemoglobin test or your uh, A1C test. And typically in a normal condition, your A1C should be like five, somewhere around there. But typically you're pre-diabetic if you're around six, and then you're definitely diabetic if you're above 6.1, all the way up you're diabetic. Now, most people don't even know they're diabetic for several years before they're actually even diagnosed with diabetes. But meanwhile, that hyperglycemia has already done a lot of damage. So we can see nephropathy, angiopathy, neuropathy, all these other things that have to deal with what I'm going to show you next. So, your normal blood vessel, and I don't, this still has nothing to do with diabetes. Nothing to do with diabetes. This all has to do with chronic hyperglycemia. Because diabetes, that's a diagnosed state. Chronic hyperglycemia is not diagnosed. That's something that you induce yourself. You need a sugary, sorry, you drink the sugary beverage, and you eat some sugary pies, and if that's a daily activity, your blood glucose is going to be high all the time. But that high blood glucose leads to this condition. 
it leads to a thickening of the capillary walls, of the arterial walls. Okay, this is the normal condition here. A nice wide open lumen, perfect, nice and supple as well. That actually uh, helps you dealing with blood pressure issues. And then over here, we have a thickened wall. And this is induced by hyperglycemia. Once again, I said nothing about diabetes. I don't want to talk about diabetes. It's a whole other thing. But now, if you can imagine, let's go back to those early slides of the occlusions that we talked about. Okay? Remember those occlusions, the fatty streak, and so on and so on. It builds up over time. So if you're hyperglycemic, if you're if you chronically consume a high sugary diet, and your blood glucose levels are chronically, and I'm going to even just say over 120 milligrams per deciliter all the time, you're going to end up with thickened walls. Now, a little bit of plaque buildup in this situation, eh, you'll be okay. But a little bit of plaque buildup in that situation, now we're going to start having some serious issues. Now we're going to start having some very serious issues because it's much more significant. You know, if I could draw on here just a little, you know, maybe even a 10% buildup in this condition, that same amount in this condition might be 30%, 40%. So, what have we learned so far? Right? Exercise and reduce your stress. And so I, I, I would love to throw a little bit more physiology into this condition, but when we start talking about the occlusions or the narrowing of those lumens and those capillaries, once again, we start talking about the neuropathies, the reduced endurance capacities, because your blood vessels are no longer able to carry the proper amounts of nutrients and oxygen to the working components of your body. And that leads to a lot of other serious conditions. Um, so even though that was kind of the last form of slides, the holistic approach to health, you know, requires you to know a little bit about the physiology of the body. Educate yourself. It's very simple. It's very simple. Know what your favorite vegetables are so that you eat them in excess. A lot of us, you know, I, I grew up in the generation that you're kind of punished by your vegetables. You know, if you don't eat your broccoli, you can't leave the table. You can't have dessert. And all of a sudden, it becomes a punishment. Oh, that's okay. There are other vegetables and fruits out there I know you won't like. And it's up to you to go out and find them. Sometimes your body will tell you what you want, but you have to experiment. You know, when you go to your favorite grocery store, shop the perimeter of your grocery store, because that's where fresh vegetables, fresh meats, you know, everything that you need. If you find yourself walking up and down the aisles looking for food to eat, don't do it. Don't do it. You don't need it. If you have to look for it in those aisles, don't eat it. Um, but uh, <laughs> the different systems of your body work together to make sure you are healthy. Your cardiovascular system helps your muscular system so that you can perform the work. Your muscular system helps to get rid of some of the components that are delivered in excess to your body. The more you exercise, the more your body will need that LDL. It really does. If you don't exercise, the LDL is going to build up. Where's it going to go? Nowhere. So you have to exercise. Your body, your muscles are going to use more glucose. You have to exercise. That's helping your cardiovascular system. Your lymphatic system is helping you take away some of those uh, components that would be to be destructive to our body as well. So, um, in the last one, what do I have up there? Oh, really? All one needs to do is eat right. Exercise and uh, I'm sorry, reduce your stress and reducing stress. 
you know, we really didn't talk too much about the physiology of reducing stress, but it really has a lot to do with a lot of different hormones in your body that causes inflammation, that causes uh, 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 what is known as a destruction of muscle tissue in your body that can lead to other problems down the road as well. So being able to reduce your stress is all a huge component of this as well, too. And a lot of people find that you can reduce your stress through exercise. I keep coming back to exercise. Yeah. But, but I know, you know, then the next question I get, well, Mike, what is the best exercise to do? I would love to tell you the best exercise. Is that, is that what everybody was waiting for? You're, I was going to tell you the best exercise. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the best exercise, well, I like to swim. For me, that's a great exercise. I like to ride my bike. That's a great exercise. You like to dance? Who's the last time you were dancing? But do you like to dance? Oh, yeah. There you go. That's exercise. Right? Yoga. There was a yoga class in here just prior to this talk. Yoga. Fantastic exercise. It's also great for stress reduction as well. So, there, you know, I can't even tell you how many exercises there are. But find one that suits you, that fits your schedule, that you know that you are. That helps you find out who you are. And do that exercise. Be consistent with it. You don't have to be, you don't have to exercise five times a day. You know, a lot of times, really, you know, three to four times a week for 30 minutes a piece. Sometimes just enough. Okay. Any questions? Yes. Heart rate and exercise. Oh, heart rate. I have been told that now that I'm taking more heart meds, okay. that you have to be careful with your strenuous exercise because of taking these medications, which keep my pulse down. Right. So what? <laughs> so I'm like afraid to really like get some sweat going. Sure, sure, sure. Now, heart rate. Typically, the only reason why you <laughs> use heart rate in the past to uh, to gauge your exercise is because that usually tells us the intensity of the exercise that you're doing, and that intensity tells you or tells whoever whoever's monitoring your exercise how long you can do that exercise, and what energy system you are training at that given point of heart rate zone. So what I tell people that are on any sort of uh, cardioprotective medication or control or almost any of those that will suppress the heart rate is exercise to your feet on a scale of, well, in our, in our cardiac rehab, we use the RP scale, the board scale, of 6 to 20. 6 being extremely easy, like you're sitting on a couch, sitting on a chair, like you're doing now, all the way up to 20. 20 being very strenuous, like the last couple of steps you take, you know, climbing a finger drop or something like that. That would, be, that would be a 20. And so what we try to tell people is to exercise somewhere around that 11 to 12 years. Now, I know. You're, most people don't keep the board scale in their mind. They don't keep the board scale in their mind. But what you can keep in your mind is a scale of 1 to 10. 1, extremely easy. 10, extremely difficult. And you want to operate, you want to exercise, somewhere about a 7. So ask yourself, you know, when you're out walking, when you're out riding, when you're out riding your bike, what do I feel like? And it is. It is. It brings you back to what you're doing as well. And you ask yourself, okay, you know what? I think I'm at about a five. You know, I'm going to pick it up a little bit. Because I want to be a seven. Okay? And that's it. Now, interesting thing about the board scale, six to 20. When you look at those number six, if you put a zero beside each one of those numbers, that's actually counting your heart rate. And this is what Born thought of when he was making up the scale. Was at six, if you put a zero beside it, that's 60, that's a rest of the heart rate. And at 200, that's a really hard working heart rate. Now, once again, he did his testing on 
college age males and females, you know, this was some years ago, and he was able to do that. But uh, but basically that's what that's called. But that's that's what I would suggest to you. Because looking at your actual heart rate wouldn't be a good thing. Same question. Oh, when you're grass you had on your previous slides, I was curious what your fasting Oh yeah, so fasting is around 60, 60 milligrams per decibel. I think on that graph it said 70, but it's around 60 to 70. So your body, I'm glad you asked that, your body really, you know, once you get in a normal condition, in a normal condition, your body, you're never low on blood glucose. You're never low. We get close to it. We get close in low meaning 70, 60 to 70. We get close to it. But there's another hormone in your body that's released on your pancreas, and it's released in response of low blood glucose, and that's called glucagon. And when glucagon is released, it tells the storage sites of glucose, known as uh, glycogen, to be released, to be dismantled, and it brings your blood glucose levels back up. So you're never hyper hypoglycemic, okay? But yes. So even if you're fasting, like, you know, for your 16-hour period, that 16 hours, whatever, is not good? Negative. Nope. Sure will not be. Uh, in a healthy condition, if you're healthy. Now, of course, there's some conditions where you, know, you may not produce the glucagon or something else is going on. But, yeah, in a healthy condition, you will never really go below 16. Any other questions? I mean, I, I really operate so much better off of questions than <laughs> just a straight lecture. So, are there any questions online? Yes, ma'am, please. Questions. Sure. Question. Um, sure. Um, when you said that you were going to do the Okay. And, and so I was at the border. Pre-diabetes. Okay, sure, sure. Um, I have, oh God, it's so hard, but I have really reduced the sugar. Okay. I try to do no more than 25 milligrams of non-food-based sugar. Okay. Um, is there hope that, you know, by doing this that I can reduce the... Oh, yeah. What was the last time you had your a one c check? I'm ready to get, I think I've done that. Oh, yeah. So the A1C will tell you how um, how well managed your blood glucose levels are, like a uh, C8 But I can do it. So, yeah, you'll probably do. You're, you're the other one. If, I mean, if you want to, but keep, keep that practice. And once again, I do say practice. I do say practice because it's something that we will need to continue to work on. Some days, some weeks, we're going to be really good at it. And then some days, some weeks, they're not. You know, we have been cursed. We have been cursed. There are, I think I, I counted it up in one of my classes that I teach, there are 215 different celebration, celebrations that we could celebrate in one year. How many days are there in a year? There's only 365. So if we, if you decided you wanted to celebrate every one of those celebrations, you know, birthday, your birthday, your friend's birthday, your next door neighbor's birthday, your co-worker's birthday, World Series, Super Bowl, your favorite team playing, your, uh, you name it, goes on and on and on. But we're cursed with that, and it's up to us to say, hey, no. I can't do this all the time. I can't eat the saturated fat all the time. Sure, we think, oh, yeah, it's a special occasion. Oh, it's only occasionally. But, you know, this week, it's Johnny's birthday. Next week, it's your spouse's birthday. And then the week after that, you know, somebody's leaving the office. And then the week after that, you're taking a co-worker out to lunch. It adds up. It really does. And so you really have to make a conscious effort to do the right thing, eat right as well. 
And just as I say that with celebrations, there's so many excuses why we can't exercise. I live, we live, sorry, those of you watching online, we live in Tucson, Arizona, don't we? The mornings are beautiful to exercise. But I'm not an early morning person. I can't wake up. I'm going to get up. It's already a thousand degrees outside. Well, you know what? All I can tell you is find a sport where it doesn't matter how warm it is. Go swim. Go to the gym. But it's COVID. I don't want to go to the gym. Okay, exercise in your house. You can walk around. You can do, uh, sit to stand. You can do marching in place. You can do, there's so many other things. Okay? There's no, there should not be any excuse for not exercising. Should not be an excuse. And, you know, I, I say this all the time, and I've demonstrated this exercise in one of my classes, and I'm going to demonstrate it right now. Is everybody ready? And feel free to join in if you'd like. Okay, you put your hands together. And if I could twiddle my thumbs long enough and hard enough, that would be an exercise. <laughs> I mean, of course, it's tongue in cheek. But it is. On a small scale, it is an exercise. You can do a hand exercise. You can do all sorts of exercises. Yeah, you can do feet exercises. You can do Everything you possibly, there's no excuse not to exercise. Um, yeah, sorry, I got on my soapbox there for a second. <laughs> um, any other questions? Yes? Well, say somebody does all this, but genetics is wrong. Genetics. How much does genetics play into it? Oh boy, I'm glad you said that to <laughs> that question. Oh my so gosh. Much. So, nature or nurture, is that what you're saying? Okay. So, we can't discount, discount that nature part of it. We can't discount that. But there is a huge, probably a larger component of nurture. Typically, in a lot of cases, there are people, when you grow up with your parents, your grandparents, your whatever, you're going to do the same things that they, that they do as far as eating, as far as exercising, as far as, you know, everything. And so, therefore... That component's going to be there. The only thing you can do about that is put it to your side. And that's it. Now, that whole genetics part of it, yeah, you, there might be a predisposition for, I don't know, gosh, I can't even think of anything now. I mean, you're probably thinking in terms of heart disease. Your grandfather had a heart attack. Your mom had a heart attack. Your dad had a heart attack. So you're... You're predetermined to have a heart attack. Well, if you live the same lifestyle they did, yeah, you probably will. But I see patients all the time that have outlived their grandparents, their father, their mother, just because they exercise. Now, of course, their patients, they ended up with heart attack, but they've lived like 20, 30 years more. So they have suppressed that genetic component of that. Okay? When their parents, their grandparents, you know, either had theirs in their late 30s, early 40s, 50s. But now this person is having theirs in their 70s, 80s. Okay? Yeah, I mean, there is that genetic component. Sure, sure. There is that component that you can't discount too much. But, you know, you have to look at your lifestyle. Are you following the same lifestyle? Major thing. Any other questions? Any other questions? <laughs> all right. Well, I guess that's all I have for you. Um, thank you for having me here today. I really appreciate it. And TMC is here for all your healthcare needs. And I'm once again I'm from TMC Cardiac Rehab. So if you need any sort of Cardiac issue. And the core is here for your exercise classes. Yes, and the core is here for your exercise classes and TMC's community outreach. Um, there will be future talks um, about all different subject matter dealing with your health and well. Thank you. Thank you very much.